set up uh, a water motif for me, uh, and two, that we have uh, outside observers up at that window, because it's helpful for understanding uh, something that I'm going to talk about in relation to Taggart, uh, but also in relation to uh, Deleuze. If you think, this is slightly unfortunate, because we're going to have to flood this room, but it's okay, we'll be all right. Um, we're going to flood the room, and they're going to be external observers, and it's going to be very muddy. There's going to be interesting things like bits of coal and things. And what you can do as you move through the room is you can only move uh, backwards. It's very mud muddy, there's a bit of a current, and you're going to be moving backwards through the room. And so you're going to see where you came from. It's going to expand slightly, so there'll be a fan behind you. All of you who read Bergson can start to recognise that cone that follows the present and the present falls away into of the pure past. So you now have, have this cone following you through the room, and therefore there's something unknown behind you, the future. There's your struggle against the current and amid the mud with those silly flippers on. As you go through the through the room. And then there's that slightly clearer past, though, of course, I'm terrible, my memory disappears very quickly, so I probably see even less than you. Uh, it's one that, that's going to recede as well. However, to the external observer, especially if they see everything that's happening to you, there is nothing like that unknown behind you. There's nothing like that receding of the past. And there's nothing like that strange struggle in the present, trapped between the past and the future. They see everything. Now, I've done you a huge favour now, because the one thing that people never really get right is which is the B series and which is the A series in Motaget. You'll now remember that flippers indicate A series, and observers see the B series. So keep that in mind, that, that image all the way through, because it's very important to understand understanding McTaggart's argument, but also why I relate to this to uh, McTaggart. Now McTaggart, 19th century, early 20th century, century Cambridge philosopher, Hegelian, quite conservative. He was among the uh, group of the friends of Russell, uh, who also included Whitehead, who had uh, Russell removed from Cambridge when he was put in prison for his, uh, not so much for being an conscientious objector, but because his acts influenced others. So he was put in prison for an act of sedition. And uh, McTaggart was among those who, who drummed Russell out of. He wrote a whole series of books on Hegel and was part of that movement of uh, British Hegelian idealism that you can see also in people like Bradley. Uh, however, he's best known, as often happens in analytic philosophy, for one article that appeared in mind. And that article is one that denied the existence of time, which is quite a quite useful thing to look at today. Uh, and what's really surprising is that that article itself is only in truncated form in mind. In fact, the article is a, a major chapter, part of, of this book, which McTaggart, this is called The Nature of Existence, and it's volume two, it's a two volume book, book a, a massive book, uh, a metaphysician uh, uh, of metaphysics. Um, and and yet, McTaggart is only known for this, this, this tiny article that many, many philosophers have written on, including J.J. Uh, Thompson, a beautiful article by, by Thompson, where she looks at the identity conditions of series. Uh, Dummett <coughs> writes on McTaggart's um, argument uh, against the uh, reality of time. Fan fantastic article by uh, Dummett as well. Um, Contemporary influential metaphysicians like H.A. Uh, Lowe uh, write about um, the 
different tactics arguments as do other metaphysicians of time at the moment, like Peter Lin, Lou Peter Lin, uh, for example. However, this seems to be a long, 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 long way from Deleuze. So why am I interested in McTaggart and uh, Deleuze? And I'm going to go through a whole series of steps to explain that interest, and I'm going to use those steps to start to, to flesh out some aspects of Deleuze's philosophy of time. And then I'm going to look at two passages in detail, one from Deleuze and one from McTaggart. Now, I kind of read that it was a workshop, uh, and therefore I came ready to work. So don't hesitate to interrupt me, walk out, ask questions, objections, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's what a workshop's for. So the, the paper is still sort of a small idea in my head, and a few scribbles. And so it'd be extremely helpful to me if you can uh, prompt me to, to think about that. So, Deleuze and McTaggart, why? First of all, there's a series of superficial reasons, almost coincidences. Uh, the first is that both thinkers think of time as series. There's this, this first connection that the, the way that the first step is only thinking about time is that time is a matter of series for uh, McTaggart and for Deleuze. Now, uh, there's a second remark to make about this is that uh, Deleuze's conception of series is much, much more uh, sophisticated than McTaggart's. McTaggart sees series very much in the way that you can think about your experience within the uh, tank that we're in now. So the A series is one of past, present, and future. And the one for the external observer is strictly relations of before and after. So that's the McTaggart series. Whereas we know that for Deleuze, we have this extraordinarily engineered view of series, where series are always coupled. And they're coupled through uh, e elements that interact across the series, but interact in different ways. They interact asymmetrically. And one of the very important influences, I think, on uh, Deleuze that's kind of underplayed in terms of this and in terms of these series is Lacan. And Deleuze's reading of uh, the Perlwine letter that you find in logical sense. So, time is series. The second is that they are uh, both uh, what I would call arrogant metaphysicians. I love arrogant metaphysicians. Uh, and what does it mean to be a, a, an arrogant uh, metaphysician? Um, and it's this. Try and guess whether it's McTaggart or Deleuze. For every word and every action implies some theory of metaphysics. Every word and every action implies some theory of metaphysics. Now you'll know, as I continue, every assertion or denial of fact, including the denial that anything is certain, implies that something is certain. And a doubt also implies certainty, that we doubt. That's McTaggart in uh, his first book on Hegel. So there's, there's another coincidence, there's this uh, commitment to uh, metaphysics that we, that we had laid out so beautifully uh, this morning. The next shared coincidence between these thinkers uh, is that the way they think about their series is in terms of events. So, uh, here though, we have a first <coughs> divide. Their, their, their paths really separate quite quickly, insofar as for uh, McTaggart, and uh, I'm kind of obsessive about the use of the prepositions in philosophy. For, for, for McTaggart, events are in and on the series. So the, the series, the time, is somehow external to the events. For Deleuze, the events are the series. Events make time. Now, one thing that I, kind of, I haven't got clear in my head at all, uh, it, but if you take that as a very radical point, 
I don't know how that interacts with uh, the, the claims made this morning. Because if you have a, a, a meta-level definition of metaphysics, it seems that that experimental and pragmatic way in which a metaphysical term, time, is, is made or created, seems to be, um, if not barred, at least given a, um, I think the term that you used was frame, the structure. Uh, <coughs> I talk about the like, frame, explanatory and expressive frame. Yeah. But, and, and, and it's both of those that, that um, I think that there's a lot at stake in the relation between those frames and the core concepts of the philosophy in terms of where we take the, the interpretation. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's just one thing that the, 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 the papers this morning uh, made me uh, think. But uh, McTaggart aims to deny the existence of time. He's a relatively loose philosopher at times. Sometimes he talks about denying, and, and or rather his interpreters in particular, talk about denying the existence of time. Sometimes it's denying the reality of time. There's a huge amount at stake in the difference between these. Uh, denying the existence of time treats uh, time uh, as if uh, it can be treated in the same way or compared to other things we might deny the existence of. Uh, unicorns, chairs, a particular space, and so on. Uh, denying the reality of time is different. That's a priority move within philosophy. It is, it, it's making a statement about the way it operates, and maybe, and I'm never too sure about this, maybe the way it ought to operate in the construction of a uh, metaphysics. The status of that ought is something that leaves me completely... Um, it's definitely there. You're, you're stipulating an ought. And you were stipulating an ought this morning. But what's the status of that ought? It's just, it's just one mm -hmm. it's like Explanation is... An explanatory ought. Well, this is like explanation is, is good. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it is, yeah. you know, like, it's good to explain things. And if it's good to explain things, then it can often be better to explain them in certain ways than others. Mm -hmm. so, like, e explanation is, is filled with what you might want to call epistemic norms. Yes. Yeah. Um, they're not the same kind of norms as you know, ethical norms, but they're there. Mm -hmm. so there's, there's good reason to try and explain things more than wrong. So sort of Williams-like moral exemplarity. Yeah, there's, there's epistemic yeah. virtue. Okay. And there's explanatory virtue. Yeah. yeah. So one day doesn't take them. No, 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 no. no. But like, it's, that, it's, it's helpful, because like, I, I mean it's more strongly that ought. Well, I think that parsimony, <coughs> parsimony is that's one of the virtue. Mm -hmm. like, if you can explain the same set of phenomena yeah. using fewer primitives, yeah. you're doing a better job than yeah. someone who, who is introducing what's yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, because that's one of the, the, the extraordinary divides uh, between uh, analytic philosophy and, and, and Deleuze's philosophy, insofar as this um, uh, conceptual pers persimony uh, that we find in analytic philosophy. Uh, don't multiply terms unnecessarily. Um, Deleuze, make sure you multiply as many terms as possible and keep doing it. And don't slow down. Uh, speed up if you can. Uh, and so there's, there's, there's a huge tension there between the, the, the two traditions in terms of their um, almost moral core. Uh, now, uh, so uh, McTaggart aims to deny the existence of time as that. It's denied the reality of time in favour of another reality that we'll see uh, in a moment. Uh, for Deleuze, events are time. Events are not time. There's no time independent of uh, events. Now, now uh, we need to, to move to, to a, uh, a, a deeper uh, reason. I'm going to go through deeper and deeper and deeper, deeper reasons why looking at Montagas and Deleuze together is particularly interesting. And, and the next reason is that Deleuze and McTaggart agree that the nature of change of becoming in relation to time synthesizes or fuses different times. So it's the, it's the nature of becoming that underpins or is the condition for the synthesis of different times. 
And this can be seen very, very easily in McTaggart's argument. McTaggart's argument is a, um, a two-stage uh, argument. And it's fascinating that different philosophers uh, concentrate on one of the stages or, or the other. But very few look at them uh, together. So uh, there's a wonderful um, moment where J.J. Thompson, who I think he's a wonderful philosopher uh, working on, um, on time, an article, The Time of King. Uh, maybe you shouldn't record that bit, um, The Time of King. But, uh, but it is a fabulous article. However, she has a little footnote. She's discussing identity conditions for series in time. And, and she notes, of course, McTaggart says that the two series slip along one another. Beautiful, beautiful uh, <coughs> um, uh, uh, the, the two series slip along one another. Um, this is very interesting, but I'm not going to discuss it. And she goes back to looking to one side of, of his argument. Uh, perhaps the, uh, the only philosopher to take uh, the relation between the two sides of his argument very seriously is Dunnett. And Dunnett does this amazingly. His article is uh, a, a tour de force of uh, economical writing that, that captures uh, a huge amount of, of difficult material in something that you can just read on the train in half an hour um, while someone has their music to them. Just go like it. It's really fantastic. Um, I spend a lot of my time on trains. Uh, now, so there are two sides to McTaggart's uh, argument. The first side is to say that the B series depends upon, requires the A series. So the observer up there can describe all the befores and afters, could describe the chronology of, of history, and you have the befores and afters of all the historical events. But essentially, there will be no time, according to McDonald's, in that observation. Why? Because there's no change. There's only change for the person going back, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a person, uh, going back through the room, against the current, experiencing that change between, for example, when they bump on something, and uh, is it a stingray or is it a piece of coal? Um, there's only one stingray in the room, so you, a few of you will be all right. Um, and of course, and then, and then you pass this change, dramatic change, from openness, as we saw this morning, to a, a degree of certainty, but then also then fades that degree of certainty uh, as, as, as we go, go back. The, the B series, the observer, can't get that. There is no change for, for the the time, to really have time for McTaggart, you need real change. And so there's a fusion that takes place in his argument from the B series, the external one, to the A series. He says, well, we can't think of the B series without the A series. Let's now think about the A series. He looks at a few objections, uh, an important one from Russell, as it, as it happens. Um, and then he looks at the A series in order to generate a contradiction. And that contradiction is what's going to justify the unreality of time. So there's a commitment to a kind of logic. Another fascinating thing about your paper was this insistence on, on, on the logic and the, the enormous difference between McTaggart uh, and uh, Deleuze in terms of, of the logic. For uh, McTaggart coming out of Hegel, the logic is traditional. Um, contradiction uh, requires sublation. Um, for Deleuze, the, the construction of the logic of sense uh, allows for a multiplication of inner logics. Not, not a, there's not that single overarching logical there's an account of language, there's an account of the generation of language, but there is not the same opportunity 
for a straightforward disbarring of something. I, I, I can definitely. I mean, one of the things yeah. I've ever seen in the body of sentence, and this is something that comes back to Nathan's question, yeah. Nathan, yeah. is there are other talks about incompatibility and incompatibility. Yeah. Right? And he, he puts it in fairly hard terms. Yeah, like the butterfly. The, but, the butterfly can either express this predicate or it can express this predicate. Yeah. It can't express both. Mm -hmm. Right? So these predicates are incompatible. Mm -hmm. right? It's a fairly like Hegelian notion. It, 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 he does more than that, but yeah. it's definitely there. There's definitely like a no, you can't say something is both this way or not. Yeah. But this is the Russian doll aspect of Deleuze's style. Insofar as you'll find him making a statement like that, but then you're not too sure whether uh, you're one of those small internal dots where he's actually describing another position that he's then going to complexify as he goes to, to the one that contains it and so on and so I'm, on. I'm pretty sure that's his position. And so, well, in, in, in which case, I think that's his position. I think, I think, think, think if, if, I remember if you mentioned Foucault, was it Clayton? Yeah. In, in your paper. Yeah. In the archaeology of knowledge, the whole thing is that um, it, it's, it's the difference between the statement and the sense of the statement, and Lacan is also it's the difference between what is it, speaking and analysis or something yeah, like yeah. that. Um, at the level of an actual discursive formation, there can be incompatibility in X and contradict Y. Con contradictions can, yeah. but, but not at the level of the statement. Yeah. Right? So um, in a similar way, actual things, yeah, the actual butterfly can't have can't be both brown and black, but at the at the level of, of virtuality, those impossibilities yeah. do exist. And that's very helpful. Yeah. And, and another way to think about it that, that I think is consistent with, with what you just said, Nathan, is that that um, it, you you'd have a, a level with uh, designation, you'd have a level with manifestation, you'd have a level with signification, all of these specific constraints, uh, and one with sense, but also. Deleuze puts them all into a, a, a circle, and therefore you have uh, sense in its relation to designation, sense in its, and so on and so forth. And, and so uh, it, it, it might be, and I think you're right, that there are going to be um, logical constraints, but it's the status of those constraints when viewed from, from, from further ones that's going to make it more problematic than it is for someone like McTaggart, where, where the, the logic is... Um, Rules, the, the, the logic, the logic rules. I, I think, I, all, all I'd say is I think that Deleuze is, Deleuze, I, I was saying this more earlier, like, look at different interpretation, Deleuze is really familiar and talking about Aristotle's logic, Leibniz's yeah. logic, Kant's logic, That's and right. Hegel's logic, right? Mm -hmm. And he's criticizing them all and saying that there's problems with them. Yeah. And in different, uh, in logic of sense, he's talking about Frege, Myron, yeah. Russell, like, uh, uh, and, and, and so he, he he is intimately involved and familiar with. Yeah. Uh, but he, he's definitely proposing his own picture. I agree, and and, and yes. perhaps an even stronger example than that would be this, the the big Spinoza, yeah. where he discusses yeah. um, Spinoza's logic, Descartes' logic, Leibniz's logic, <coughs> and in, in, in really great great detail. So, so I'm not denying that Deleuze writes about logic. It's it's what the status is in terms of. Um, the, uh, the motion of the arguments. So, so let's um, uh, go on. With, with McTaggart, uh, the deeper reason. The two thinkers now, as we've seen in terms of the relation to the logic, uh, offer far reaching critical arguments against each other. I don't want to, to take sides and just say to those who's right, well, of course he is. Um, uh, uh, but, but in, in the, the paper that I'm writing, it's going to be more of a, of a, of a critical dialogue. Uh, and this, can, this comes out very strongly where um, McTaggart, you know, logical contradictions, and also Humean forks, which are used all the way through McTaggart's argument. You can even see it operating at a sort of very uh, general level of the A and B series. Um, that's not naturally a Humean fork, that one, but he, his whole argument is always these forks. Uh, Take one, can't take the other, therefore you have to move up to a different level, uh, and so on. So if you mean folks that deny the compatibility of series, their internal coherence, and events on them in here. So, so let's go up to uh, another uh, level, and this is now going up to a, a conceptual uh, 
uh, level of uh, the uh, relation between those and the target. Um, on the one hand, you have a logic. On the other hand, you have a logic of sense. So, so that there is a, is, a, is a key is a key difference. You have a conception of synthesis in Mertaggart, whereas uh, as a counter to that, and as a development of that, you have uh, Deleuze's extraordinary, uh, it, it isn't his pure creation, but it's certainly his development, and that's uh, a disjunctive synthesis. So it's crucial that the, the syntheses are disjunctive. And, and, and that's what, what worried me a bit, and again, it generated a question about uh, the papers that we've had in the paper this morning, is uh, what is the nature of the disjunctive synthesis when it's applied to the, th the metaphysics itself? So in, in writing a metaphysics, are you subject to disjunctive synthesis? If you are, it seems that any settled account and any uh, notion of, for example, onto theology, or account of uh, metaphysics in relation to, to being, or time in terms of, and so on, uh, all, all of those, as propositions, are going to themselves be subject to what those propositions are saying. And the strongest statement about that is going to be that there's a disjunctive The metaphysical statement itself is a dice throw, is another way of putting it. Uh, which means that uh, we have to take what Deleuze says about irony and humour very seriously. Where, where is the irony and humour in the construction of the metaphysics? And um, as, as much as obviously metaphysicians are the best people on earth, uh, they also have a tendency to be a bit humorless. And, <coughs> I certainly do. Um, and it, it's, it's how do you get that irony and the, the humour back into the construction of the, of the metaphysics? De, Deleuze did, of course. You, you, you have De, Deleuze writing different from repetition, and then alongside that logic of sense, two, two extraordinary uh, texts. I was once speaking at um, a conference, and uh, someone Said, uh, but, but you've got difference in repetition, you've got logical sense, and you're, you're talking about them sometimes at the same time. You can't do that. Uh, and uh, but, and I, I, I thought, look, the, the two texts are talking to each other, they're arguing. Um, like like, the, like that, that film we were talking about uh, this morning. That, that's what those texts are doing. They're, they're in this struggle against uh, one another. But, but it's a struggle that fosters disjunctive synthesis that allows the text to, to um, fight against the emergence of a settled metaphysics. Um, so, uh, disjunctive synthesis. In Deleuze, you also have, and this is important, this is something you don't find at all in uh, Montaigne, and this is the element of the transcendental. For, for Deleuze, uh, there are transcendental relations between dimensions. Relations of uh, condition. And finally, for McTaggart, you have series that are still thought of in relation to uh, lines and successions. In the A series, it's a, uh, a changing succession. In the B series, it's a fixed succession of uh, before and after. But Deleuze introduces, because of his transcendental method, a nexus of processes that cannot be reduced to single or even countable lines. It's an interacting nexus of times. So that you, you have this notion of perspectives that we had this morning, even within the times themselves, uh, looking in, uh, on to uh, Even deeper reasons. For McTaggart, there's the denial of the real existence of time as condition for real priority of change. And the reason he does this is he believes that if he allows for the reality of time as change, he's going to run counter <coughs> to the Hegelian system. 
If we allow the time to change, then something disastrous, according to Metaget in his reading uh, of Hegel, is going to happen to uh, notions uh, of, uh, of the concept in particular in uh, Hegel. Whereas for Deleuze, you have an extension of the real to pure change through time as and only as a process. So on the one hand, time is disbarred to allow a higher reality, the reality of the concept, to have be given its full right and dominion. Whereas for Deleuze, it's always an operation of extension that takes place. Am I boring you yet? Because I've got lots of further uh, reasons. Uh, even deeper reasons. For Montaggart, there's a defense of Hegelian reason and absolute spirit against the threat of time as contingent change. And so, uh, again, interacting very, very strongly with the papers this morning, this notion of probability or contingency, that there's a, a very interesting question about, about contingency and uh, probability. So far as we talk about absolute contingency, you couldn't talk about absolute probability. Um, and I want to, 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 to keep this term of, of contingency uh, within the division system over and above uh, probability. So I think the first synthesis of time involves a notion of uh, probability, but I think that when you move to the third synthesis of time, and in particular uh, to, to, to the figure who has who's been underplayed this morning, in Nietzsche, and Nietzsche and eternal return, when you move to, 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 to that, uh, well, then you move from probability to uh, a, a notion of contingency. And of course, the dice throw is treated in relation um, to Nietzsche. That, that's where the dice throw uh, keeps coming up. And of course, Malarmi. And I, I haven't read Contemma yet, his book on, on Malarmi yet. Have you? No, no, it's no, supposed no. to be great. It's always about it. But it's interesting because, like, the question is to how different Deleuze and Malazu have been on this particular issue of contingency, which I think we can like things. Yeah, but there's also an element of chercher le père, because obviously Badiou has that same yeah. difference with the with, um, um, Are you recording that? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, I, I always say you're not allowed to record me. And I, I remember why. Basically, like, yeah. in, in those repetitions, it's important that where you he uses this wonderful phrase of like, God dances on the volcano. You know, like, he, he's talking about, he says, laws are produced. Mm. Like, the eternal return rumbles beneath law yeah. and produces law. Yeah. Well, that's very similar to some things like Melissa says. Yeah. The hyper chaos produces yes. these worlds of law. Yeah. And, and so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a definite sort of affinity, but the, I think there's a certain sense in which mm. the words view of it is a lot more subtle. But with with Melissa you definitely get a negative theology which is isn't there in Deleuze. Yes, well maybe it's hard to tell because his, his, his book on, on God obviously is not out yeah, yeah. so I wouldn't want to, to jump to, to a judgment uh, on that. So instead instead of the Metacatian defense of Hegelian reason and absolute spirit against the threat of time, you have in the case of Deleuze the affirmation of unconditioned, creative redoubling of events, an affirmative counter-actualization. Two very, very uh, different uh, positions. And so now we arrive at the deepest uh, motivation, um, and that is, again, a moral motivation. That's what's so interesting about Montague. You, you read the work on the A and B series, and you realise that um, everybody's been talking about a truncated version, uh, to the point where, in fact, he had many other series. If you if you read if you read the book, straight after discussing A and B series, in fact, it's got the C series. There's nothing like the the A and and, and B series. And so you find commentators go, and Montaigne even has the C series, but there's no point discussing that. Um, so there's this truncated uh, version of uh, Montaigne's argument. 
there's um, the, the complete denial of his uh, philosophical history and, and its basis in uh, many books on Hegel and lectures on Hegel. There's a wonderful quote from one of his contemporaries uh, at Cambridge, I can't remember which one, it might be broad actually, um, I think it's broad, uh, who says, um, never could understand Hegel, but luckily McTaggart's is Hegel but clear. And so, so Hegel was, was, was made possible by McTaggart's clear expo exposition. But, but McTaggart's an interesting thinker because his motivation is, is moral. And his interest in, in Hegel leads into um, many public lectures that he loved to give uh, to, to a general public on the importance and role of philosophy as uh, edifying. He also wrote uh, a, a relatively successful uh, book on uh, immortality. He was interested in the notion of the, the soul. And in relation to time, and his whole discussion of time and Hegel, he's fascinated by the question of evil. Now, this is particularly interesting because it connects McTaggart to another thinker who was part of the same group uh, in Cambridge, um, meeting regularly, and that's Whitehead. Because Whitehead also uses this term, this term evil, in the end of process and uh, reality. So, so the term uh, evil is an important one. Uh, and what's McTaggart trying to do? He tried to move towards an eternal, just, and rational immortality against evil as pointless change. So we started with two thinkers who have a, a set of superficial similarities. And as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you find that there is almost a maximal divergence. What McTaggart's most concerned about is what Deleuze most wants to uh, affirm. McTaggart does not want pointless change because then you can't redeem evil. Which is why you have to deny the reality of time uh, in that metaphysical priority manner. Because if you give the priority to that time, such as the A series, there is no guarantee against the return, amplification of evil, and behind this evil. Whereas Deleuze, and this is one of the, the weaknesses of Deleuze's philosophy, when viewed from a certain political standpoint, embraces that openness to a, a radical uh, degree. Why? How can he do that? He can do that for this reason. For Deleuze, the evil is in reason itself, where it works with process to deny it. So it's an, an imminent betrayal of reason uh, that Deleuze is constantly working against. For example, in his um, double-faceted engagement with images of thought, for instance, and his constant uh, return to a battle against common sense and good sense. That's where reason works with process to uh, deny it. And instead, again returning to Nietzsche, you have to have eternal return of, as a uh, pure difference. I can't agree that. How am I doing for time?
so uh, he, he says we, we now move to, to the C series, which in truth is no series at all, if you think about it as time. So what he was trying to do all, all along, see all the time, all, of, all along, what he was trying to do all along um, is uh, liberate or, or, or be able to talk about the Hegelian C series without it being subject to time to change. Or, or to contingency. And so, so long as he, he, he uh, was trapped uh, with the priority of either the B series or the A series, he couldn't then move on to talk about the, the C, C series, which would then allow him to talk about the nature of existence, which is kind of involved in immortality, um, uh, reliability, and all sorts of things like that. Why do you think he only published the A and B in the mind? Um, uh, that's fascinating. That's the most important. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating question, and again, uh, it's a kind of interesting. Um, it's a puzzle because uh, the argument from uh, his first book on Hegel was also published in mind. So, in fact, there there were four versions at least of his denial of the existence of time. There's the one in the Hegel book. There's one that he published in time that was uh, in, in, in time. <laughs> you see, the greatest journal should be called Time, not Line. <laughs> yeah. um, the one that he published in, in mind, the first one, which was then criticized by F.C.S. Schiller, the pragmatist. The pragmatist. Um, and, and there's a very interesting discussion with Schiller uh, between um, uh, a, a pragmatist who wants to uh, say that uh, it's, it, there is no value to be gained from an argument that denies the existence of time. Um, because uh, what philosophy should be doing is generating practical tools, in effect. Uh, and and uh, that is where that quote that I read to you at the beginning about words always involving metaphysics comes from. That's his, the beginning of his answer to, to Schiller. Then there's the argument in mind, which was part of his um, master work, which is the, 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 the two volumes um, of uh, the nature of existence, where he only published um, volume one. Volume two is posthumous. And uh, it was edited by uh, Ward uh, very, very slowly. I think uh, he died in 22 years ago. Um, and, and so uh, this isn't a completely reliable version either. Uh, so so that, that explains it. It's, um, the, the article in mind is a, is a short initial step of a much, much, much bigger uh, argument. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Just out of curiosity, because yeah. I've only read the, the short yeah. biographies, yeah, the yeah, AMB yeah. series, is the idea do you think to deny time precisely because the gap in Hegel is the way in which the notion is supposed to return from history back to logic? That 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 never that transition never gets made. Right? Yes. The famous problem the transition is it takes is supposed to take place in history, but it's not a historical fact. Yeah, and, and that is the reason. And um, that's, what's interesting about Taggart, in particular, his works on Hegel and elsewhere. Uh, is that uh, he, he returns to uh, discussions of history um, and to uh, discussions of uh, the way in which ideas become locked, hist historically locked, uh, such that uh, it, it would appear that uh, environment, um, practical considerations, pressures and so on, uh, take priority over the um, internal development of the concept um, and of the logic. Now, uh, there's actually a wonderful passage, but you know what it's like. If I start looking for a passage, it'll be that kind of embarrassed me looking through and not being able to, uh, uh, to, to find it. And I'll demonstrate that I'm right about that now. <laughs> Here we go. Um, 
and this is uh, uh, fabulous. So this is uh, section 350 of volume two. Um, if this view is adopted, so he's moving towards the, the C series, the result will so far resemble the views of Hegel rather than those of Kant. So he's moving away from Kant towards, towards Hegel. For Hegel regarded the order of the time series as a reflection, though a distorted reflection. Okay, that's the key. The, the, the time that needs to be denied in terms of its reality is, 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 its reality is a distortion. It's, it's getting rid of a distortion. Um, though a distorted reflection of something in the real nature of the timeless reality. That's the reality of reason and the concept. While Kant does not seem to have contemplated the possibility that anything in the nature of the noumenon should correspond to the time order which appears in the phenomenon. So, and this is him moving to the C series. So you can see how it, it, shocking the, the history of the debate is um, in terms of uh, just the, uh, I guess, the ethics of interpretation. Here is a, a thinker who is known for, for one argument. That one argument has been truncated, torn out. Um, and all you need to do is go four pages on. And it's rehistoricized developed and so on. So, so the legitimacy of doing that is, is suspect, just to say the least. Uh, go, go, go ahead, sorry. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I found the passage. In good time. Yeah. I just want to remember this, again, this like, Hegelian theme. Yeah. The, where it often gets talked about as like, becoming without time. Yes. And he yeah. wants to do that. Yeah. Section of logic where he just kind of comes in and it's like non temporal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's this idea that you, know, you have an absolute idea mm. which is the sort of structure of the concept that unfolds, but it, it's unfolded as completely non temporal. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but like for here, there is the externalization, the self externalization, and Henry might correct me here. Self externalization of absolute idea within nature. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when you get like becoming in time, mm -hmm. which is, and, and, and although <coughs> Hegel thinks that there's an important sense in which the ground of temporal becoming yeah. is a temporal becoming, yeah. insofar as its absolute idea externalizes itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, that priority is not the same as a kind of rejection of the reality of temporal yeah. becoming. And so I'm wondering where you think that Pagat sits here. I mean, is he stronger than Hegel himself? Yeah, he is, and he says so uh, quite explicitly. And he has um, two concerns uh, with that position. And uh, the way he develops his argument, again, so this comes before the argument about the reality of time, it's kind of the, the propedeutic to it. Um, or in terms of the distinction of, in between series, and, and it's around um, if we take that view, where or how do we think the beginning and end of time? Because From the point of view of the ground, there has to be a beginning and an end. Otherwise, this is Metallic's argument, yeah, a, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with it, but this is how he puts it. Otherwise, um, you would have that ground thrown into a bad infinity. Never, never finding a beginning and, and never having, having an end. Um, uh, therefore, there has to be a way of uh, thinking that beginning and, and end strictly from the point of view of the point of view is a horrible expression strictly from the ground rather than from that unfolding that you, you described. Well, so, so that's what Taggart's argument. What, what, what strikes me is I think the response here will make is like the relationship between you know, absolute idea of nature, and the third term there is absolute spirit, right? Um, in Hegel, is that it's it's almost this kind of combination of the 
Aristotelian conception of God, mm -hmm. but with Spinoza's conception of God. So Aristotle got his thought in itself, Hegel, that's the idea, concept of God in itself. But whereas for Aristotle, God is at the beginning and the end, right? It's, it's, it's where things come from and where things go to, yeah. right? For Hegel, the, the, ex, the externalization is, is Spinoza's ex, God expressing himself in moments. It's this sort of what, what Spinoza would call the, the kind of imminent causation rather than yeah. efficient causation. Which would, so if you take a sort of more Spinoza state from Hegel, then yeah. Hegel would be fine with would be, would, would, well, you could respond on the back of that. Yeah. I think that there's another point then to, to make on this is, is that um, take a man after your own heart. He, he wants Hegel but without God. Yeah. And he wants immortality without God as well. And so there's an immortality in the concept. And um, uh, do you know what um, the, the phrase that was said as his casket went in to be burnt? It, it was the, the thing that man should fear, le um, should fear least is death. From Spinoza, and that phrase is now uh, 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 his memorial uh, from, from Spinoza. That's Montaigne. So that's an extraordinary thing. Um, but I've been bore boring my um, uh, uh, Spinoza uh, experts in, in the department about Montaigne, and uh, finding that fact was the only thing that redeemed me in their lives. <laughs> oh, he, he, he did like Spinoza because look at what happened at his. What strikes me as interesting in relation to the relation to the relation to the relation to this point of externalization mm -hmm. and nature is that, you know, a lot, one of the classic misreadings of Hegel mm -hmm. is that Hegel thinks everything is necessary. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, Hegel, Hegel thinks, and this is a kind of weird, mm -hmm. weird alternative yeah. analysis, yeah. that Hegel thinks there are all things that are necessary and one of them is contingent. One of them is necessary and there's some contingent thing. Yeah. And the, the domain of contingency in nature. Yeah. That's why that's yeah. the idea of externalizes itself. Yeah. Yeah. So you get time yeah. because you have to have contingency. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I said it's a, uh, it's a question about uh, how you, you prioritize and what you define as, as ultimate reality. Yeah. Um, because uh, you can say that as much as you like, but that still means that you've got a problem if you need to. Uh, ascribe reality to those two things. Um, and, and that's the, the problem we're struggling with. We've come a long way from Deleuze, by the way, so people might want to ask about yeah. Deleuze rather than, than, than Hegel and Tanya. Uh, yeah, sure. I have a question which is about the notion of, uh, the question of evil within the work of the Deleuze, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you were making a statement about that uh, in the works um, for the Deleuze, evil is in reason itself. Um, and I, I just have a question that I'm quite hesitant to ask about. But okay. how, how was that reworked in the works of uh, the Lives of Watari, for example, in the Lives of Life mm -hmm. and Lives of Death, in which the line of death would be uh, limiting the evil somehow? Mm -hmm. And that's a fascinating question. Thanks. Um, you, you, can, you can see it, um, I think, perhaps most strongly when they start to talk about um, uh, macro and micro fascisms. Um, and uh, that, that way in which the, uh, the line can um, generate its, its own uh, self-destruction and force as, as destructive of, of others. And what, what's so fascinating is, is just how, how, how well working with, with uh, uh, Guatapi um, develops that theme from the earlier diverse that you find in Logic of Sense, for example, in relation to the discussions of alcoholism, and in particular Lowry, um, and the whole notion of uh, the figure, I don't mind translating that term, the, uh, the false line. Um, uh, and um, what Guattari uh, uh, allows 
is, is to move beyond that, that um, sort of geological, geological, uh, we nearly fell into the fault line, um, that, that geological sort of um, play of, of levels uh, and, and uh, of, of wounds in logic of sense uh, to a, a much richer materialist account of, of uh, lines and strata and lines and, uh, and so that there's an explosion. But again, that, that allows me to come back to, to the, again, the dangers of describing the as a metaphysician, because um, uh, if, if we're looking for the, the perfect account of the metaphysics, it means we kind of have to choose between those, rather, rather than see them as um, uh, intention with one, with one another, or reverberate, operating on one, one another. So no, that's, that, that's, yeah, yeah that, that's exactly um, what I was alluding to, with that kind of very sparse account of the reason. Yeah. I know it's a very sunny, nice day, so it's perfectly appropriate to break her. It's a, it's a concept, a concept of people on parents, it's also available in the work of the verse. Ah. Uh, that, funnily enough, um, I, I, um, I skipped that um, because it's so uh, difficult. Because there is a concept, I think, of some sort of immortality in Hinduism. And you can see it in Immanent Alive, uh, when he discusses riderhood. And riderhood, this scandal, <coughs> as he's dying, dies into to, to, to the neutral, into to a set of um, uh, infinitives, if you like, or, or, or into sense, in such a way that his, his, his persona fades away as he's dying. And people start to... Um, work strictly for that which is yeah. not the scoundrel. They, they work to save his our life as opposed to save his life. life. Yeah. Exactly. Now the participation, and I deliberately use that term from the reversal of Platonism, that the participation in a life seems to imply some kind of immortality. And you find another way in which this is touched on in Deleuze when he describes two deaths. And, and in his discussion and, and work on, on death, the, what you could call the molar death, although it's a later term to, to the um, it is in no way final. If it's in no way final, there's some sort of beyond and, and that, that, in terms of, of his philosophy of time, is really obvious. If you, you start to look at this um, nexus of processes, any existing thing is that nexus. And therefore, there is a continuation in the processes. So, we leave a trail in the pure past. We return in the pure differences that return in eternal return. Obviously, we don't. No personality does. No identity. The same level of returns. And yet, there's some conception of, of immortality. So, but it, I'm, I'm sort of struggling in answering this question because it's, um, uh, it's something you know, that I want to tiptoe around. But I, I think that, that there is potential for um, a, a long analysis of uh, immortality in Hinduism. And, and it, it, it's powerfully present when you think also of many of the examples uh, that he uses when he turns to literature. Bartleby, for instance. Uh, Bartleby for Deleuze, this pace ancien. Uh, is, is not a final tragedy. Why not? Because there's some kind of living on 
Equally, there's some kind of living on for T. Lawrence <coughs> in the shame that he expresses and, and participates in. So, so that's one way. And there's another way to get me going on, on Deleuze and immortality, and uh, I won't stop, so people are probably looking very frightened by now. There's another way that we can start thinking about it, and that's through Spinoza and immortality, and book five of it. Uh, because there too, the, the immortality in, is, is in no way the immortality of any kind of personhood. Um, and yet, there, there is an, an immortality. Um, is it a certain compromisation? Because you yourself, really, you, you mentioned writing with one person and you talk about my yeah. proper future. Yeah. 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 And this is the thing, in different repetition, for itself, we were talking about the recency. He uses Nietzsche against Bergson. Yeah. And the whole point of using Nietzsche against Bergson yeah. is to, to, to say that well, Bergson has this idea of like pure memory yeah. in which everything gets retained. But yeah. Nietzsche has the idea of forgetting. It's yeah. like not everything gets retained. It turns out yeah. Yeah. some things are lost and they're lost irre irrevocably. Yeah. And so that really problematizes oh, it does. the notion of immortality. I agree. And, and the test here is. Whether that notion of immortality, when looked at rigorously, would be any consolation whatsoever. <laughs> um, I haven't thought that one through. Um, it's a bit too close to the bone. Um, I guess it would. I guess it would be some kind of consolation. Someone, I can't remember who one said it means. Deleuze is, is almost sort of struggling in entropy. It's, it's like, it's a, not an immortality that's guaranteed to you, but it's it's one that you, that's going to be kind of struggled for and retained in the face of sort of the, 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 the potential to just things fall apart. But you, you have to have some kind of notion of an affirmative constellation, which is a strange you know, com combination of the terms. So does that, does that answer the question? Yes, 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 yes there is a question of immortality. Uh, but it's nothing like the immortality that we would traditionally be working with. Uh, but it does seem to be a necessary component of Deleuze's philosophy. Uh, and uh, you can see it very strongly in, in his um, turn away from finitude.
table two to them, you use different habituations for different children. Some get it in different ways. So, so some are just, others need tables, others need, need tricks, and so on. And over time, it becomes a habitual. So in, in that uh, sense, um, a, a, a first synthesis in, in, in a series, uh, there is a, uh, a combination of, of uh, uh, body and, um, let's call it concept. But your example of the four pints is important because uh, that, that, that table, um, that particular uh, multiplication is going to, to have a, a much, much more extended function, a set of logs. So you know that four pints is enough and five is a headache. Now, that, those uh, connections in, in uh, Deleuze's philosophy uh, start to, to connect uh, the the habituation that seems to be just one line to, to men. It seems that you're just trying to get um, four times nine across to, to, to the pupils. But in, in fact, when you're doing that, you're also selecting many other lines. Yeah, and and, and um, uh, perhaps if, if the way that you do it is through, through a, um, a spatial technique, you're extending number, number into space. Uh, and so, the habituation is many lines. As you, 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 you move ahead, you want to, to encourage some kind of autonomy. So Deleuze is then going to say, memory isn't only the habituation, it's also associated necessarily with an act. So he, he introduces the act, and that's a moment in the, the present, it calls the agent. And then relates it to, to the future. So what memory is going to be, is going to be um, a, a greatly, um, it, almost anything that you approach from a Deleuzean point of view, this is also why Deleuze and, 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 and Guattari is so, so powerful, is that it's going to be, you're going to be able to approach it from many, many different angles, all of which are, are interrelated. And so the, 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 the deepest level, the way in which, because the, the next question is, well, can you go anywhere? What's the point, and where's value? Um, is that you have to do some kind of diagnosis of the underlying problem that's generating your puzzlement and your interest and your excitement and your uh, reaction and, and so on and so forth. Um, so you don't only operate on a, on, on a, um, a straightforward level of a difficulty. We're operating um, nearly always unconsciously uh, in relation to um, deep, paradoxical, and recurrent problems. And you can perhaps see that when you realize that any teaching is also a damaging. So whatever you do, in relation to the, the, the teaching the, 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 the children different ways of, of learning, you are also making some things less likely. You're preparing certain future disasters and, and so on and so on. And that's when you can start to see the underlying problem. And that's often only revealed by that. My God, why did we do it like that? So, What's memory then? Memory is, is the habituation. It's a, a memory of, of the agency. Yeah, it's a, a, a standard memory that you find in the concept. It's also, though, a, a memory as in a trace of the interaction with the problem. There's many, many things. Um, it's very round about answer, but, that, but that's what, what's going on. But just as a very brief follow-up, yeah. um, is there any sort of break?
some, some, some very sort of, uh, basic uh, moves it is the, um, the restriction of potential. That isn't in some way a risk or an opening onto, the, onto another potential is about. And so in education policy, you frequently see, so for example, the restriction of potential through um, for, for lead tables and just for lead tables. There you, you have a, a massive restriction of potential. But it's not to release any other potential. It's not a gamble. It's not created in itself. So, and, and that you can get very easily out of, out of this. Uh, and it came out really, really strongly. In fact, both papers um, at this moment. Um, but, but that, uh, and this step, but that, that, that potential, that, um, that, that creative moment, um, almost as they with, with uh, uh, Derrida was calling it a gift almost, uh, but uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't a gift, it's, it's the wrong term. So, so there you, you, you have it, is that? Yeah. So it isn't, it isn't that it's um, value free, but it's that the values always, always going to come late and hard and need to be destroyed. Destroy your emergent values. Really good time to start now. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just wondering when you talked about the distinction between um, targets and uh, times of, as a, a succession mm. and you talked about the Hurst Street of Times as a nexus mm. of processes, and you said that the map view of time and the nexus as opposed to succession is transcendental. Yeah, yeah. And it's transcendental because it's a. Well, but what do you think is transcendental about? But did you say the last part? What is? What, what was? What, what's what's transcendental there? What's what do you mean by transcendental there? What, what do you see as transcendental about? It, 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 it's great if you ask me this because now I can uh, go back to the quote that I was going to base the whole talk around, um, <coughs> but, but never quite got there. And, and it's um, the quote that shows that it's an excess that shows that the uh, key concept operating in the nexus is the concept of dimension. Uh, that shows that the nexus is, is complete, that is, uh, that you, you, you have um, uh, present as condition for future, future as condition for the present and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's here. Um, I, I, I do it in French and English because when you're working in very short quotes, it's important to sort of have both get it exactly right. Uh, so it says, voilà, voilà que dans cette dernière synthèse du temps. So there we have it that in this last synthesis of time. So and it's, it's dernier, it's not last as in highest, it's, it's that he's moved through a whole series of synthesis of time. Present and past are now only dimensions of the future. So, now you can see the nexus being constructed. Uh, present and past first had future as their dimension, now their dimensions of, of the future. And now the transcendental move. The past as condition. So uh, th that's the transcendental move. Um, the past is not cause. The past. Uh, is not a uh, container. The past sets certain formal conditions for the future. And the present, he says, as agent. So, so now, is that um, transcendental? I think it is at another level. This is the, the uh, the present as uh, agent of selection. 
in the return of the past as condition. And so he then goes on and says, the first synthesis, that of habits that we just talked about, uh, constitutes time as a living present. Those, those uh, school children in the living present, each trying different approaches. So depending on, on um, the way in which they can learn mathematics. A living present is practicing. Um, constitutes time as a living present. In a passive foundation that the past and the future depended upon. So, so there it's a condition in terms of, of dependence. The past depends upon the, um, the, the present as that which is going to select different series to different degrees. And you can very much see it again, if you don't mind me using your example, you can see it in the class. You're doing it because some of them have different abilities. Uh, if you go with the, the ones who, who, are, who are quick, you're, you're selecting uh, not pupils, but you're selecting series of, of habituations through time and, and futures. You can be inclusive or not, so you're changing the probabilities. It's exactly right for, for, for that particular task. Now, uh, it's, in, it's in that way, so in the use of condition higher up, and then it's going to continue, I won't go on too much more, that, that, that you have relations of, of, that are transcendental. Now, what's important is, and, and this is something where I'm, what I've written to publish, um, it is that um, I have an oversimplistic account of condition. Because I find it hard to explain without doing it in a historical context in relation to Kant, that I've done in relation to Deleuze, but I find very hard to, to, to transmit without having some sort of like historical hegemony working through the, the Kantian approach. Um, so, so that's the answer. That's the way in which it's, it's transcendent. Um, and a, a further sort of quick answer is that it's um, transcendental also through its resistance to um, reduction according to a single rule. So you have a ninefold nexus and then you have the problem of, of why is it in principle not possible to have an, an overarching, for example, algorithm. And, and it's because the relations between the different times are transcendental. That is, um, they are between realms, spheres, processes, is what I prefer, that are radically irreducible to one another. Now, if the processes are radically irreducible to one another, and yet interact, that's when I call the interaction transcendent. And you can see how the term that I'm using is more. So, thank you for the question. Yeah, well, one uh, follow up on that would be what, what, do you, what do you mean by saying that you, you want to shy away from understanding transcendental theory in terms of the relationship to Kant, instead of being historically hegemonic or something like that? But wouldn't, wouldn't that relation to Kant be precisely what justify the use of because I don't see how the way you're using transcendental there yeah. is. Yeah, yeah be, because um, I think that I would want a, um, a definition of, of transcendental that was uh, more, more proper to the word. So that's, that's the first step in the argument. Uh, because the, also though, because of the way in which the transcendental operates within Kant. It's not the same as the operation uh, of the transcendental in Deleuze. And one, one key way of looking at that is that it's a, a, a two-way asymmetrical relation of the transcendental. So it, 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 it's not only conditioned, conditioned, it's that the condition is conditioned in, in, in Deleuze. So, uh, 
it's, um, it means that the, 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 the transcendental is um, it's a really it's going to be a really crass way of putting it, but it's a, a constant putting back into the mix, rather than allowing any um, fixing of um, the So the transcendental is therefore a force in much more in terms of principles rather than categories. So, so that's 